And we had mentioned the idolatry that was rampant amongst them and how that idolatry began. And there was one final point that was left that time did not allow us to uh, elaborate on. And I think it is very relevant and very important because this aspect demonstrates to us what our religion is. And it demonstrates to us the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Now, the interesting thing about the Jahili Arabs, the Arabs before Islam, was that they actually believed in the same God that we believe in. By the same name and the same attributes, and that is Allah. You see, they never depicted Allah as an idol. They made idols of Allah, of Al Uzza, of Manat, of Hubal. They made idols of all of these beings, but they never made an idol of Allah. There was no idol called Allah. Because they knew that Allah could not be represented by an idol. And they knew that Allah was their creator and their originator and their sustainer. Allah says in the Quran, if you were to ask them who created you, they would say, Allah created us. If you were to ask them who sends the rain from the heavens, they would say, Allah. If you were to ask them who supplies you your rizq, your food, they would say, Allah. The Quran says, if you were to ask them who is the Lord of the heavens and earth, they would say, Allah. And this is interesting because their paganism is not like the paganism of modern religions. If you ask them who is their God, they will say, Krishna or Buddha or something, these are groups who say, no, Allah is our God. And Allah is our creator. And Allah is our sustainer. And yet they are not Muslims. And we don't consider them to be Muslims. Even though they say there is no creator other than Allah. And there is no sustainer other than Allah. And there is no Lord other than Allah. So when the Prophet is coming to them, he's not coming with a new God. He's not coming with a new deity. They know it is Allah who created them. Yet why are they not Muslim? Well, because they're worshipping idols. Well, why are they worshipping idols when they know that Allah created them? The Quran tells us, Surah Zumur verse 3, Surah Zumur verse 3, Allah says, that if you were to ask them, why are you worshipping these beings? They say, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى We're only worshipping these beings so that they can bring us closer to Allah. Notice the ultimate goal is Allah. These beings are stepping stones, they're intermediaries. They're simply tools we use to get to the grand deity, and that is Allah. Surah Yunus verse 18, Allah says, They worship besides Allah these beings that are useless. And they say, these beings are our intercessors between us and Allah. Our intermediaries. You see, we're too sinful. We're too unholy. And these beings are holy beings. So we go through them to get to the holiest of holy, and that is Allah. Now notice here, this is very important because their shirk was not in rejecting Allah. It was not in saying, Allah and Al-Uzza created me. It was not in saying that Allah and Al-Uzza will resurrect me. No, they firmly believed Allah is the creator, sustainer, nourisher, everything. By name Allah, not Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Allah. Yet they're worshipping other than Allah and they say, we're too sinful. We need to use intermediaries to get to Allah. Now this is important because unfortunately, we have Muslims in our times who fall prey to the exact same mentality. Word for word, letter for letter. We're sinful people. Change Allah to Wali. Change Uzza to Sheikh. Change Manat to Peer. And you get the exact same concept. We're too sinful people. We can't worship Allah directly. He's too holy. So we have to go through the saint. Or they will say, we have to go through the Prophet ﷺ. We worship this being. We make prayer to this being. We sacrifice to this being. We invoke the blessings of this being because this being has a high status with Allah. He will plead our case to Allah. And all of us who have family back home, we know that this is unfortunately common amongst uh, the Muslims around the world. And this mentality is exactly the mentality of the Jahili Arabs. It is exactly the same. And this is compounded by the fact that if somebody says, how dare you compare a peer to a lat? How do you compare my sheikh to a lat? The response is, what is a lat except a peer and a sheikh? What is a lat? Do you know the origins of a lat? A lat was a... Allah was the main idol of Ta'if, right? We said last time, what is the main idol of Mecca? Who can remind me? Hubal. The main idol of Mecca is Hubal. And this was the original idol. Where did it come from? Who can remind me? Syria. From the 
Amalekites, the Amalekah, came from the Amalekah. So this is the original idol that was there until the Prophet uh, got rid of it in the conquest of Mecca. Then the second major idol was Allat. And that was in Ta'if. These were the two main idols, Allat and Hubal. And then Manat was the, uh, the third and Uzza. So these are the main idols. Now, Allat, what, what is Allat? Allat was a man who used to feed to the pilgrims a type of soup. And the word for making soup in Arabic is Latta Yaluttu. And Allat is the one who grinds. Allat is the one who basically does the thing to make the soup. The barley, you grind it and then you make the soup out of it. It's not his name, it's his title. And this was a man who would stand on the road towards Mecca and everybody who went there, he would, he was a generous man, he would feed them. And so they called him Allat, the one who gives the soup, the one who feeds, the one who makes the barley for the soup, Allat. When he died, they said, let's commemorate him. He's a good man. He's a righteous man. So they build a monument, a mausoleum. And in our religion, we're not supposed to build a monument on a grave because of this reason. Exactly because of this reason. So they said, let's commemorate him. He was a good man. So they built a big structure. And what happens when you build a big structure on a grave? People come, they rub their bodies on it, they put their hands on it, they want to get blessings. And bit by bit, slowly but surely, it becomes an idol and a god that is worshipped besides Allah. So what is Allah except a holy man, a righteous person? And we already mentioned before that the most common being who is invoked on earth besides Allah is Jesus Christ. The most common being that is worshipped besides the true God is Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ, an evil being or a good being? He's a good being. He is one of the greatest of all prophets and messengers. You see, the slippery slope doesn't occur with evil people. I mean, how few people worship shaitan, right? The satanists, how few are they? And yet, look at how many people worship Jesus Christ in the billions. Because it's easy to slip with a good man. You put him above his place. You take him to a status above what he deserves. And this is what our religion came to prohibit. No, you don't worship anybody including the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. You don't go through him to get to Allah, meaning you don't direct your prayers through him. You take him as a role model and you don't take him as another god, a demi-god, a semi-god. So it is important that we understand that the shirk of the Jahili Arabs was a very unique type of shirk. It is not the shirk of let's say the Hindus or the Buddhists or the Zoroastrians. Because these groups, they believe in another god besides Allah. They don't believe in Allah. The God of the Arabs was the God of Abraham and Ismail and Ishaq, and that is Allah. That is the God that we believe in. Their shirk was not in rejecting Him. It was in affirming Him as being too holy. We can't get to Him directly. We have to go indirectly. And it's very important that we as Muslims therefore understand what our religion is about. And that is there are no intermediaries between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was a point related to the last lesson. Now we now move on to today's lesson. <coughs> And we began by pointing out, well, we just talked two lessons about how evil Jahili Arabia was, how bad it was. And next week, uh, we're going to continue this. Uh, Dr. Bashar is going to be speaking next week. I won't be here. And we'll talk about the social circumstances of Arabia. Uh, and, and again, so many evils taking place in Arabia. Now, if Arabia was so bad, was so evil, why did Allah choose Arabia and the Arabs for the Prophet to come in? I mean, why didn't he choose the Romans who were the mightiest civilization? Or the Persians who had an ancient civilization? Why didn't he choose another nation? Why in the back, can't say backwaters, the back sands of Arabia, why in this desert, in this nomadic lifestyle that didn't have a civilization, it didn't have a script, it didn't have anything, it didn't even have a government? Why did Allah choose this society to send the last prophet? Well. There are many wisdoms that we can derive, that we can glean from choosing these groups of people. First and foremost, the Arabs and Arabia was in between the two major superpowers of the time. And those were the Sassanids and the Byzantine Empire. Right? The Eastern Roman or the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid or the Persians. The Romans and the Persians are simplified. Uh, the more correct is the, the Byzantine and the, the Sassanids. So Arabia is smack in the middle. Or you can say southmost, but it is in between. Wars are taking place right above Arabia, in the Syrian hemisphere or, or, or land. Wars are taking place for 400 years between the Byzantines and the Sassanids. Arabia is right there in the middle. 
Additionally, so it's geographically very uniquely situated. It's connected to the two greatest international superpowers. Yet it is distinct. Connected, but distinct. And subhanAllah, what happened in 30, 40 years? Arabia conquered these two superpowers, right? Had Arabia been in China, it would not have been able to conquer these two superpowers. By being connected and yet separate, just on the border. The very first lands of conquest, Allah willed that these two mighty nations be conquered by the Muslims within 20 years, within 30 years after the death of the Prophet in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab as you all know. Additionally, the Arabs did not have a history of colonialism or aggressive behavior. Because the Arabs were busy fighting amongst themselves, they never challenged Rome, they never challenged Persia. So when the Arab armies first marched towards Rome and Persia, i.e. after Islam, the Romans and the Persians were laughing. Who are these Bedouins wanting to attack us? And it is said that the, the Sassanid emperor treated uh, Sa'd and, and, and the other uh, Muslim leaders as children. Because are you gone crazy? Your armies are going to attack us? Go back and we'll give you some gold coins if you want. I mean, don't, don't bother. They treated them like kids because they couldn't believe that a group is coming from Arabia. Uh, the Arabs never had a colonialist influence. They never were aggressive to the superpowers. So it was a surprise completely coming out of this land. Another point is that the fact that uh, the Arabs did not have their own unique civilization. Now what do I mean by civilization? Some people ask me, what do you mean they didn't? I, when, when I say they didn't have civilization, I mention certain uh, uh, benchmarks of a civilization. The first benchmark is a unified government. If you don't have a unified government, you don't have law and order in society. I mean, that's the first benchmark of a civilization. You have a unified government. And then another benchmark is literature, arts, architecture. Now, the Arabs did not have literature. They had poetry, which is one step less. They did not have written literature per se, because they didn't have reading and writing. Right? Another benchmark is, is architecture, buildings. The Arabs did not have buildings. They didn't build anything of lasting significance. Whereas the Romans, I mean to this day, the, the Hagia Sophia, uh, it was built before the Prophet by a hundred years. And it is still a marvel that we go in and we look at. You know, in, in, in Istanbul and in Constantinople. And other places, the, the, the palaces of Persia, they're still around. Uh, per, uh, Parasopolis outside, outside of uh, uh, Tehran. They're still around. You can go and see them. Magnificent structures. The Arabs at the time didn't have that. So again, I mean, I'm not trying to, I mean, some people, uh, they, apparently there were one or two people that felt a bit offended when I said this. But it's a fact that Islam came and gave the Arabs izzah. Instead of being offended, they should take pride. That Islam came and made the Ar Arabs the, the, the top nation. Before Islam came, the Arabs were considered to be a backward Bedouin nation. And they were like that. And Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ your, We have given you a book, in it is your legacy. Your dhikr, your legacy will be through this book. This is in the Quran. That you didn't have a legacy before this book came. Before this book came, you weren't anything. Now when this book comes, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ This will give you a legacy that people will look up to you by. Right? So this book came and civilized the Arabs. So the fact that the Arabs didn't have this civilization, they didn't have a unified government, they didn't have all of these factors, when Islam came, it made it easier for the Arabs to develop a unique and their own culture and civilization. There was no competition. If Islam had come to the Romans, it would have been very problematic. Because they have their entire structure up and running. And for Islam to come there, you have to then fight the status quo. In Arabia, you can say there's somewhat of a vacuum. There is no status quo to fight. So when the Prophet unites the Arabs for the first time, the, 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 the wars that he's undertaking are relatively small. There's no mighty unified government that's attacking him. And this is of the blessings of Allah that he chose Arabia for this. The first time the Arabs were ever united is under the Prophet They were never united before him. He came and he united all the Arabs, all the descendants of Ismail. Before this, they were not united. And so the fact that they didn't have a civilization is in fact a blessing in disguise. Because then Islam came and brought that civilization. And a unique Islamic civilization with its own language, its own literature, its own script, its own coinage even, its own... Everything came, everything, even its own architectural style, as you know. The Umayyads had their own, the Abbasids had their own, the Andalusi, all of this came. It came because there was a vacuum. And so the Arabs came and they filled that vacuum with Islam, and they then brought forth a new civilization. Another benefit and wisdom of sending the Prophet to uh, Arabia was the fact that 
because, and we, we referenced this slightly before, because of the internal warfare amongst the Arabs and their relative backward state, the rise of a political entity from Arabia was completely unexpected. Nobody could have predicted that there will be a political force coming from Arabia. It is as if right now, somebody pointed to one of the lowest uh, GDP countries, let's say on the index, right? Uh, one of the sub-Saharan countries, let's say, and said in five years, this will be the superpower of the world. Right now, everybody's thinking it's China or this or that. We have two, three names. And then right at the bottom, there's one or two names. Imagine if somebody said, no, 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 all of that is wrong. It's going to be one of those countries at the bottom. It's not even a threat. Nobody's thinking about it. So the Arabs and the, uh, the, the Romans and the Persians were completely uh, unprepared for the Arabian conquest. Also, another point of benefit is that Mecca was the site of the first house built for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was the place of Ibrahim and Ismail. Therefore, it was most appropriate that Mecca become the place of the first universal religion. Because Islam is the first universal religion. Every other religion that Allah revealed, which is now called Judaism or Christianity, these are revealed religions, they were local. They weren't meant to be universal. We believe uh, that Jesus Christ did not come for all of the world. He came for the children of Israel. We believe that Moses was not sent for all of mankind. He was sent for only the Jews. Yet the Prophet was sent for the entire world. So it is befitting that his place be the place where the first house of worship was ever built on earth. We already said two weeks ago that Allah says in the Quran, the first house of worship was the one built in Bakka, which became Mecca. This is the first masjid ever built on earth by humanity, by Ibrahim. So it is befitting that the first universal call come from that very valley, from that very sanctuary, from that very house. Yet another benefit of why Allah Azza wa Jal chose the Arabs is that even though the Arabs did not have certain qualities, they had other qualities that made them very good to be receptive to that message. Of those qualities was the purity of spirit. Purity of spirit. They were not polluted by philosophical indoctrinations. They didn't have other... They were simple people. And being simple has its positives and its negatives, right? Being simple has its positives and negatives. And of the simple, of the positives of being simple is that when truth comes, you accept it more easily. You're not clouded by philosophical baggage, if you like. You don't have lots of weird ideas. You're a simple person and that's why generally speaking, even in society, subhanAllah, the first converts are always the sincere sincere, innocent people. This is the first converts. They're always the sincere people. Not the ones who are convoluted, not the ones who have... No, it's just simple. Another benefit that the Arabs had was that they were a people who were so used to hardship, so used to lack of food and lack of water and, and everything, that this of course helped the armies in, early, in the early conquest of Islam. You see the Romans and the Persians were spoiled troops. These were troops that needed supply lines. These were troops that had lots of armor, lots of baggage with them. Now the Arabs, they didn't have all of this. And they're used to traveling in the desert for long distances with small amounts of water, small amounts of food. And early Islamic conquest needed that. It needed that stamina that neither the Arabs, that neither the Romans nor the Persians had. And so Allah chose a group that He knew would be able to benefit Islam in its early time. Also the Arabs had characteristics that were very positive. Bravery. They were not cowards. They were brave people. They were proud, and in a sense, pride, proud, pride can be negative and pride can be positive. If you're proud of something that is worthy to be proud of, if you're proud of being a Muslim, this is positive. And if you're proud of being of something that is racist or something, this is negative. So having an element of pride sometimes is good. There were also honest people. The Arabs hated lying. They hated lying. They were very honest people. And there's many evidences to show this. Of them is the famous story of Abu Sufyan with Heraclius, which we referenced uh, last week when we talked about the emperor of Rome met Abu Sufyan. Right? And he asked him a series of questions. And we didn't mention it in a lot of detail. But Abu Sufyan was brought in front of Heraclius. And the rest of the caravan remained behind him. Because Abu Sufyan... Because the Heraclius knew that Abu Sufyan is an enemy to the Prophet. He's not a believer in the Prophet. So Heraclius wanted to make sure that Abu Sufyan is speaking the truth. So he put the back of Abu Sufyan, all of the people of Quraysh were at his back, the caravan. And he's facing Heraclius. And then he told the interpreter to the people behind Abu Sufyan, if Abu Sufyan lies, make a motion to me that he's lying. 
tell me that he's lying. Now they're all pagans. They're all, they're all you know, uh, idol worshippers. None of them are Muslims. Abu Sufyan said, were it not for the fact that my people would have sh- accused me of being a liar, I would have invented lies against the Prophet at that point in time. I didn't want to tell the truth. I didn't want to say all of these things because they're all positive. Is he the most noble? Is he honest? Is he trustworthy? Is he this? He said, were it not for the fact that my people would call me a liar. In other words, despite being a pagan, he didn't want to be called a liar. Truthfulness, honesty was something that was prized amongst the Arabs. Also, the Arabs were sincere in their oaths. If they gave a promise, they would uphold it. We quoted last week an incident that really shows this. A promise that was upheld. Abdul Muttalib and his promise to Allah. Abdul Muttalib and his promise to Allah. Nobody is even telling him that, oh, this is a promise you made to me. He made a promise to Allah and he wanted to fulfill it. The Arabs were people who, they were people of their word. And they abided by their word. And that's why there were no written contracts in Arabia until Islam came. There was no need for it. If a man said it, that was his word. There was no need for witnesses. If a man said it, that's it. He said it. He's not going to retract on his word. So treachery was considered to be very, very evil amongst them. And the final point that we'll mention is that the Arabs were, of course, the best uh, horsemen. There was no denying this, that the Romans and the Persians could not compete neither with the horses of Arabia nor the riders of Arabia. So the horses of Arabia were the best horses to this day, the Arabian horses. And by the way, there are a hadith about Arabian horses, by the way. And the Prophet ﷺ praised horses from Arabia. And subhanAllah, and these are hadith that are authentic. And subhanAllah, to this day, the world knows that the most prized horses are Arabian horses. And our Prophet ﷺ, uh, said that the best horses are uh, the Arabian horses, the horses of this peninsula. And subhanAllah, to this day, as we said, the Arabian horses are the best because our Prophet ﷺ said so, so the barakah remained or the blessings remained in them. So the horses were the best and then the riders were the best. And they were the most accustomed to the most brutal war. They're not used to heavy armor. They're used to riding, as we said, long distances. They're used to uh, a, a very difficult type of war, which the Romans and the Persians would not going to be accustomed to. So for all of these reasons, and then of course, there is the issue of the Arabic language itself. The Arabic language is a Semitic language. And the Semitic languages are far more eloquent and powerful than languages based in Latin. Anybody who has studied Hebrew, Aramaic, those of you who have studied Arabic, you understand the transmutation of the three-letter word. ذَهَبَ فَعَلَ فَاعِلُ يَفْعَلُ مَفْعُولُ All of these transmutations, this is a very Semitic issue. It's not found in the other languages. And it's a very powerful tool. If you learn one verb, ذَهَبَ, let's say, from it you can derive over 200 nouns and verbs and concepts. Because the same verb will give you roots, will will give you structures that you will derive over 200 different uh, nouns and adjectives and verbs and whatnot. This is an amazing language and it's a powerful language. And generally speaking, it is said that the Semitic languages are the most eloquent languages. We of course believe this theologically, but even people who are not of any theology, they say that the, the Semitic languages have a power and beauty that is not found in the other languages. Of course, Semitic languages uh, in our days is only Hebrew and Arabic that are spoken. Uh, but of course, in, in the days gone by, it was Aramaic and Syriac and, and all of these other languages Those are all Semitic languages. And the final reason why Allah chose, or the final reason we will mention, of course, there must be many more. The final reason that we will mention why Allah chose the Arabs is of course the most obvious one. And that is, the Prophet Ibrahim salam made a dua. The dua of Ibrahim salam as he's building the Kaaba, him and his son Ismail. And he says, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolam minhum. O oh our Lord, we pray to you that from our progeny, you send forth one prophet or messenger, rasoolam minhum, who will come to them and recite to them your signs, your ayat, and will purify them and will clean them, him, and will teach them the book and wisdom. So Ibrahim and Ismail made a dua that there should be a prophet from their progeny. Because he knew that there would be prophets from the other progeny of Ishaq. He knew this. Because Allah says in the Quran that when Sarah became pregnant, فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقَ وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقَ يَعْقُوبُ Even before Ishaq was born, 
And of course the Old Testament expounds upon this much more. Allah knows if it's true or not, but the, the Old Testament says that uh, the angels or the God said to Abraham that through this son of yours shall be my covenant. Now we believe there was a covenant through that son for thousands of years, but then it was transferred to the sons of Ismail. So uh, Allah says that, that when Sarah was pregnant, we will give you Ishaq and after Ishaq we'll give you another prophet, Yaqub. So he's being told that there's going to be many prophets from Ishaq. And we believe that every single Prophet that came after Ibrahim, up until the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came from the children of Ishaq. We believe that every Prophet after the generation of Ibrahim was from the descendants of Ishaq. We believe this. We give them that privilege because Allah gave them that privilege. But we say the final Prophet, only one Prophet came after Ismail from his progeny and that is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Ibrahim makes a dua that, Oh Allah, from this son as well, I want a child. I want a prophet who will come to his people and who will come and recite the signs and purify and teach them the book. And so of course the children of Ismail are the Arabs and so the prophet Ibrahim's dua had to be fulfilled and that is why the main reason we can say that Allah chose the Arabs. The main reason, I left it for the last, is that the prophet Ibrahim said, I want a prophet from this progeny, from this son and that is indeed what uh, what the, uh, the, uh, Allah gave and that was exactly the Prophet Sallallahu said that he said in an authentic hadith Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim he said I am the response of the dua that my father Ibrahim made Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim I am that response of the dua Wa ana bushra Isa ibn Maryam and I am the Glad tidings that Jesus predicted. And to this day in the New Testament, there are references that Jesus says, I must leave you for, uh, for uh, of course the Hebrew or the, uh, the Greek says, uh, paraclete to come has been translated in different ways. Perhaps this is a reference, and this is what some Muslim theologians say, that Jesus is saying, I have to leave for the other one to come. And the Prophet Muhammad is saying, and the Quran is saying as well, that Jesus predicted his coming. So he said, وَأَنَا بُشْرَى And I am the good news. Uh, 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 the good news has generally been translated as the gospel uh, by the Christians, but we believe that Jesus Christ predicted the coming of the Prophet Muhammad So he's saying, I am the good news that Jesus Christ uh, told would come. So he is the da'wah of Ibrahim and the bushra of Isa ibn Maryam. This is what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. We had already pointed out that the lineage of the Prophet was the most noble lineage. We mentioned to the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet said that out of the children of Ismail, Allah chose Kinana. Out of the children of Kinana, Allah chose Quraysh. Out of the children of Quraysh, Allah chose Bani Hashim. And out of the children of Bani Hashim, Allah chose me. And so this means that the Prophet was chosen from the most noble of all lineages and we firmly believe that there is no lineage more noble than his lineage. Let us now move on to the issue of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu We spoke about Abdul Muttalib and his ancestors. We now get to the Prophet's direct and immediate parents. And these are of course Abdullah and Amina. Abdullah and Amina, both of them, both of them, we have but a few lines about their life and times. We have very little about them for a number of reasons. Firstly, because the both of them, as we know, lived very short lives. They both died in their early 20s maybe, maybe even before this, 18, 19. Secondly, and so obviously you have a short life, you don't have a, you know, a lot of memories to leave, I mean you have only lived a few years. Secondly, the both of them died before it was known that the Prophet is a Prophet. So nobody's recording you know, the life and times of even those 20 years. These are regular people of Quraysh, they might be noble, they might be good, but there's, not, there's no prediction that these are going to become the parents. Thirdly, when the Prophet becomes a Prophet, it's already been 40, 50 years, 40 years, right, since his parents have died. And by the time he gets to Medina, 53 years, by the time he himself passes away, 63 years, who's alive to remember what happened 63 years ago? Right? So when Islam finally reached Izzah, power, when Islam finally became stable, who is living to remember those early days of Islam? And that is why we're going to come to this, inshallah, after Ramadan when we get there. We all know that the Meccan period lasted 53 years, 40 before prophecy and 13 after prophecy. Correct? 53 years. The Medinan period lasted how many years? 10 years. Now, 
If we were to put all of the chronicles of those 53 years in a volume, and all of the chronicles of the Medinan years in a volume, the Medinan volume would be three times the size of the Meccan volume. Even though the time frame for Medina is 10 years, and Mecca is 53. Why? Because when Islam is stable, that's when people can record and, and write and talk and, and remember. When Islam becomes powerful, that's when it is easier to record events and remember them. When the followers become peaceful and stable, not when they're persecuted, not when Bilal is being dragged in the streets of Medina and Ammar is being tortured. I mean, they're not going to have time to remember and, and, and narrate to their children, right? So, if this is the case of the life of the Prophet that we have one volume versus three volumes of his life, what do you think of his mother and father? So, sadly, we have very little information, much of which is legend, much of which is not quite, we don't know for sure if it's true or not, but what we do know, what we do know, inshallah, we'll try to narrate it uh, that we have here. Abdullah, as we know, was the one whom Abdul Muttalib was about to sacrifice. I already told you the story that he was saved. Right after this, immediately after the saving of, of Abdullah, Abdul Muttalib decided that he needed to choose a bride for his son. According to one report, he was 18 years old at the time. And one version says he was 20, 25 years old. But he was a young man, so a young man at the time. And Abdul Muttalib, chose for him the daughter of the chief of the Banu Zuhra. The Banu Zuhra were one of the tribes of the Quraysh. We said many times, and the average Muslim is unaware of this, Quraysh is a big tribe. Within it are many small sub-tribes. We have to memorize this. Quraysh is the large tribe. Within it are many sub-tribes. The Banu Hashim is one, the Banu Zuhra is another. So the chief of the Banu Zuhra had a daughter by the name of Amina. His name was of course Wahab. So the chieftain of the Banu Zuhra was Wahab and he had a daughter, Amina. And so Abdul Muttalib proposed on behalf of Abdullah, Abdul Muttalib proposed to Amina binti Wahab on behalf of Abdullah. And this proposal took place shortly before the caravan season, when the caravans were about to depart to Syria, shortly before that. And so Wahab agreed to marry his daughter to the son. So they were both chieftains, right? And so when you're the son of a chieftain, you want to marry the daughter of a chieftain. Abdul Muttalib is the chief of the, of the Banu Hashim. And uh, the chief of the, of the Banu Zuhra is uh, Wahab. And so the daughter of Wahab, Amina, and the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, they agreed to get married. So Abdullah got married to Amina just a few days before the caravan departed. And it is said that he barely spent three or five days with her before he had to go with the caravan. He spent barely a week with this new bride of his, and he then departed on the caravan, as you know, never to be seen again. So they had an extremely short marriage, because as soon as they got married, he had to leave for the caravan. Now there are some legends here, or there are some stories here that are not authentically narrated, but there's no harm in, uh, in, in mentioning them, because there's nothing wrong with them. Now I have to point out here that I try my best to keep authentic stories only. We need to realize that just like with any story, and our Prophet is no exception, people wanted to add legends and make it bigger and bigger. And in fact, it is very true to say that because he is the Prophet of Allah people wanted to add more details and make it more flowery than it is. Our job is to stick to the facts. Our job is to look at it academically through the science of hadith, the science of transmission. We don't let our emotions sway us. Sometimes it's okay to narrate such stories if there's nothing wrong with them. And this is one of them that their legends are mentioned that Abdullah had a type of brightness on his face. He had a type of uh, nadara, it's called. And that it is also mentioned that he was a very handsome young man. And so the young uh, damsels of the Quraysh were all eager to marry him. The young ladies of the Quraysh were all eager that he would propose uh, to them. And it is said that a number of them hinted at this to him. That why don't you take me as a bride and why don't you, uh, you know, propose to me. I'll be more than willing to become your bride. And he said, I have to follow my father, whatever my father wishes. After he married Amina, those same ladies that were uh, suggesting themselves to him to marry, they stopped taking an interest in him completely. And so he said, what is the matter? Why are you not you know, speaking with me or anything? So they said that you had a brightness in your face that no longer 
is there. This is what is said, meaning that after he uh, was with Amina for a while, this brightness left, meaning that obviously it's now the progeny, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah knows best, this is not an authentic one, but there's no ha harm in narrating something like this. Nonetheless, so within a week of marriage, less than a week after marriage, he only spent a few days with Amina. He then had to leave, catch the caravan, go all the way to Syria. On the way back from Syria, he fell severely ill with the caravan, and he was slowing the caravan down. And by the time they got to Yathrib, which was later to become Medina, he said to the caravan, I'm slowing you down. I have relatives in Yathrib. I will stay with them until I recover. You go back to Mecca. Question, who were his relatives in Yathrib? How did he have relatives in Yathrib? Go back two weeks. Abdul Muttalib's what? Mother. So that's his... Grandmother. It's his paternal grandmother. Now subhanAllah, notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared some relationship with the Prophet in the city he would go to. And this is very rare. The Quraysh married amongst themselves. It's very rare for uh, them to go to out of nowhere. Yathrib is, is not a city that is common for them. right? And yet Allah prepared this. There is a relationship with Yathrib. The Prophet says, and we're going to come to uh, in two weeks, he visited Yathrib as a six year old boy. Because his mother wanted to take him there, right? So there's a relationship with the city. Allah has in His divine plan, this prepared. And so Abdullah says, I have my cousins here in the, uh, the, the tribe of Banu Najjar. I have my cousins here. I will stay with them until I recover. You go back to Mecca. By the time the caravan got back to Mecca, Amin is all excited. My husband's coming back. I want to tell him that I'm pregnant. And lo and behold, he's not with the caravan. So most likely Abdullah did not even know that Amina was pregnant. In fact, if we believe this version of the events, which is Ibn Sa'ad, he could not have known because he was only with her for four days. So by the time the caravan comes back, she is told that he is sick and he should be coming in a few weeks after he recovers. And then the next news comes that he has in fact passed away in Yathrib. Whatever the sickness was, we don't know. He had passed away at a very young age, 20, 22 years old. He passes away and uh, he is buried somewhere over there. Nobody knows where he is buried. Nobody has ever discovered this. No, can anybody do it now? But he's buried somewhere in uh, Yathrib. So Amina remain, becomes a widow at the age of 18, 19, young, young age, maybe even younger than this, carrying the offspring of Abdullah. And the Prophet Sallallahu is born in the famous year of the elephant uh, and this leads us to the issue now of the date of his birth. When exactly was he born? Now, and this is the next discussion which will last us quite a while because I believe that this is interesting to discuss and also has relevance to modern times. Now we, we have been told that the Prophet Sallallahu is was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal and this is the commonly known date. Yet the fact of the matter is that our early historical textbooks mention a number of dates. And there is no unanimous agreed upon decision regarding the date of the Prophet's birth. The Prophet told us certain things that we know for sure. Of them, in the famous hadith of Sahih Muslim, that a man asked the Prophet, Why do you fast on Mondays? Why do you fast every Monday? He said, this was the day I was born on. And this was the day that revelation began to me. I Iqra came down on Monday. So we know for a fact he was born on a Monday. Okay, that narrows down a day of the week. How about a year? Well, there are some narrations that mention the year as well. There's a beautiful narration in which Uthman ibn Affan asks one of the oldest uh, Qurashis, and his name is Qubath ibn Ashyam, after the death of the Prophet He asks him, أَأَنْتَ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, Are you Akbar? Meaning, what does Akbar here mean? Older. أَأَنْتَ أَكْبَر Because he's an old, old man. But of course, Akbar also means bigger or grander. Right? So, uh, Qubayth, uh, uh, Qubayth smiles and he goes, the Prophet ﷺ is akbar minni, but I am older than him. Asannu minhu. He changed the question because the question gave its. It, the, the question is alluding to the fact: Are you bigger than the Prophet ﷺ? So he said, No. The Prophet ﷺ is bigger than me, but I am older than him. And asannu minhu. And then he says, The Prophet ﷺ was born amal fil. Aha. We have a year now. 
He was born in the year of the elephant. And as for me, I remember my mother taking me outside of Mecca as a child and I saw the dried up green dung that the elephants had left. What does this show? What does this show? That he remembers the elephant's dung, which is basically the same year, the year of the elephants, right? And the Prophet ﷺ was born that year. So he's a little bit older than the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ is bigger than him. This hadith is narrated in Tirmidhi. So, uh, Qubayth therefore puts a date. Also we have, uh, somebody asked another Sahabi, Suwayd ibn Ghafla, about the Prophet's birth, and he said, the Prophet and I were both born the same year that we were born Am al-Fil, the year of the elephant. So from both of these narrations, we can pretty much verify that the Prophet ﷺ was born in the year of the elephant. Even though there are some opinions he was born 10, 15, 20 years before, after. But these are very minuscule minority. The bulk or the vast majority of early historians said he was born in the year of the elephant. We already said the Arabs did not have a calendar. We already said that they would have a calendar based upon events. The year of the drought, the year of the invasion, the year of the elephant. And then for the next 5-10 years, they would say 2 years after the year of the elephant and three years before the other, until something else big happened. And then they began something else, right? So this was their calendar system until Umar ibn al-Khattab came and said, we need a calendar. This is a part of civilization to have your calendar, right? We need a calendar. And then he made the Islamic Hijri calendar, which we follow to this day. So pretty much we are confirmed now two things. The year of the elephant and a Monday. Okay, what is the year of the elephant? Difficult to date because we don't have any type of chronicles of the Abyssinians and what they did, but by and large, piecing together various factors that are beyond the scope of this, majority of historians say this corresponds to 570 of the Christian era. 570 of the Christian era. 570 CE, the Prophet ﷺ was born. Now how about the day of the, so it's the year of the elephant, fine. How about the, day, the month and, the, and the, the day of the month? When we look at Two of the earliest books ever written about the history of the Prophet ﷺ, we find differing accounts. The most famous book of history is of course Ibn Ishaq. We talked about it, the Seerah of Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq died 150 Hijrah. Ibn Ishaq says without any chain of narrators, he's writing from himself, that the Prophet ﷺ was born on a Monday the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal in the year of the elephant. So this explains why this opinion is present. He says very clearly that the Prophet was born on a Monday on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal in the year of the elephant. However, between him and the Prophet are 100 and almost 200 years because remember going back to the birth of the Prophet is, is 53 before Hijrah. So between him and the birth of the Prophet is 200 years. And he doesn't tell us where he gets it from, who's narrating this to him, what is the chain of narrators. When we look at the second earliest book, and this is called the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd, which was written around 220 or so Hijrah, the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd, the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd says that it is said that the Prophet was born on a Monday. Some people say, I quote, he was born on the 10th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Others say he was born on the 2nd of Rabi' al-Awwal, end quote. Two opinions, neither of which conform to the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Abbas, it is said, also said the 10th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir, the famous historian of Islam. Ibn Kathir in his Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah says that the majority opinion is that the Prophet was born in Rabi' al-Awwal, but others have other months as well. And then scholars differed with regards to the date of his birth. One group said he was born on the 2nd of Rabi' al-Awwal. Number 2nd of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir says this was the opinion of Abu Ma'shar al-Sindi, a famous scholar of history, died 171. It was also the opinion of Ibn Abd al-Barr, a very famous scholar of Andalus, died 463. It was also the opinion of Al-Waqidi, who died 207. Al-Waqidi is one of the most famous historians of early Islam. So we have three very early authorities saying he was born on the second of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir goes on. Another opinion is that he was born on the eighth of Rabi' al-Awwal. He says, this is the opinion of Ibn Hazm, 
a famous scholar of Andalus, Imam Malik ibn Anas, you all know Imam Malik, the scholar of Medina. And the opinion of a Zuhri, who is, again, I mean, I cannot explain how famous a Zuhri is, 128 Hijrah, and opinion of Muhammad ibn Jubayr ibn Mut'im, a number of famous people of the past, the eighth of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir moves on. A third opinion is that he was born on the tenth, on the tenth of Rabi' al-Awwal. So we have now second, eighth, and tenth. The tenth of Rabi' al-Awwal. He says, this is the opinion of Ibn Asakir, and the opinion of Ja'far al-Sadiq. Who is Ja'far al-Sadiq? Cousin Nuh. He's the descendant of the Prophet ﷺ and the Shia consider him to be one of the Imams. He's the sixth Imam for the Shia, but he's the descendant of the Prophet ﷺ. So one of the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ says that he was born on the 10th ten, uh, of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir says the fourth opinion is that he was born on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal and this is the opinion of Ibn Ishaq. But there is no isnad on this matter. In other words, there's no chain of narrators that mentions anything about uh, the, the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Ibn Kathir does say that this is the most popular opinion in his time. Ibn Kathir died 770 something, way after. In medieval Islam, 12th Rabi' al-Awwal is the most popular opinion. And from medieval Islam up until our times is the most popular. But in early Islam it was not the most popular. The 5th opinion, the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal, the 6th opinion, the 22nd of Rabi' al-Awwal, the 7th opinion, he was even born in Rabi' al-Awwal, he was born in Ramadan. And this is the opinion of Zubayr ibn Bakkar, who was the first scholar to ever write a history on Mecca. And he died 256 Hijrah. And then there are other opinions as well. So, to summarize, there are over 10 opinions in the earliest books of Islam, about the exact day that the Prophet was born, none of them are, is, let's say, uh, indisputable. None of them are clear-cut. None of them have solid evidence. All of them are the opinions of early authors and narrators. And to be very academic, the opinion of the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal seems to have much less weight than the 2nd, and the 8th and the 10th. Because these three have tabi'un taba tabi'un. They have descendants of the Prophet ﷺ. Whereas the opinion of the 12th, it is by Ibn Ishaq, who is 200 years after the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, and he doesn't have any chain. So if this is the case, why then is the opinion of the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal the most popular? So much so that for many of you it's shocking that I'm daring to go against this fact of history, right? This might be blasphemy to tell you that how dare you? How, why is it so popular? Very easy to respond. Point number one, Ibn Ishaq. I already mentioned that 90% of authors who write about Sirah, they only rely on Ibn Ishaq. They just take Ibn Ishaq and summarize it, redo it, translate it, do this and that. That's what they do. And it's a good book, but it's not the only book. So because Ibn Ishaq is Ibn Ishaq, and because he says 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, end of story. No questions asked is going to be the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. The second opinion, or the second reason why the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal became so popular, is that, and this leads us to a controversial issue, but I don't shy away from controversy as you all know, is that the first time that the Prophet's birthday was celebrated as a public event, i.e. the Mawlid al-Nabi or the Milad al-Nabi as we call it, the first time that it was celebrated, the authorities who celebrated it chose the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. And because they chose the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, now that's it, it just spread like wildfire. The day and the event and the custom now I have written a detailed article about the history of the Mawlid and who started it and how did it become popular and you can refer to it on Muslim Ma'ad. It is called uh, A History of the Mawlid by myself. You can just Google it and you'll find it three parts. Uh, and just to summarize, the Mawlid or the Milad nabi the first recorded instance that we have of anybody celebrating Milad nabi is around 517 Hijrah. 517 Hijrah i.e. the 6th century of Islam. So for 500 years, the concept of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet is simply unknown to the Muslims. They cannot, because celebrating birthdays is not a custom that comes from Islam or from, I'm not saying it's haram by the way, I'm saying it's not something that the Arabs would do. 
They wouldn't record birthdays to celebrate them in the first place, right? Many of you, I know my own grandmother, had no idea when she was born. They didn't record these things. It was not something of significance to them. The day and the month and the year that you were born. This is a Western concept that is now modern. Everybody records it. But that was not something that, if you even ask your own grandparents, many of them would not know. You know, it's not something that was recorded. And so, the concept of celebrating it is a very late addition. And the first group that celebrated it were the Fatimids of Egypt. And the Fatimids uh, are a dynasty that are not of Sunni theology. They are uh, an extreme Shi'i dynasty. The Fatimids are the ancestors of, in today's time, the Aga Khanis and the Buhra, the Ismailis. Uh, the Fatimids are the, the ancestors of these groups, the extreme Shia groups. And for a number of years, they ruled over Egypt. The Fatimid dynasty ruled over Egypt. And they instituted over 30, 40 festivals. And of course, there's a reason why rulers have festivals. Why do people have festivals? What does it do? Distracting and economy. People come and buy and sell. Popularity of whatever is called the nation state in our times or in their times, the ruling family, right? So there's a reason why the ruling class want to have public festivals. There's a, there's a uh, philosophy behind it. And the Fatim has had over 30 or 40 public festivals throughout the year. Every few weeks there was a major event and festival. And they celebrated Ghadir Khum, they celebrated 10th of Muharram, these are all Shia festivals. They celebrated the birth of this Imam, the death of that Imam. And of those celebrations, it is said, they celebrated the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu This is the first time in Islamic history that we come across the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu As I said, 517 Hijrah, 517. And the people who are doing it are these Fatimids. And as we said, there's clearly a motive for them to do it. When it was done in Fatimid Egypt, then 150 years later, some Sunni governors thought this was a good idea and they imported this particular festival. And because it was done in Egypt on the 12th of the Rabi' al-Awwal, Egypt at that time was a Fatimid state, they imported it to Mosul, which is outside of, uh, of Baghdad, it's a place in Iraq. The first uh, Sunni governor, he was not a Khalifa, the first Sunni governor who celebrated uh, the Mawlid, celebrated it around 670 or so Hijrah. So for 670 years, this was unknown in the Muslim world to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet And this celebration was done once again on the 12th, and it became a very luxurious festival. And various governors and rulers would then compete with each other who could have the bigger festival and the grander festival. Free meat and free uh, uh, bread and, and free you know, uh, gifts were given out and people. So it became a, a, a literally a national festival. And as I said, there are reasons why rulers want to do this. And so they began to compete with one another in order to attract the, the trade, the commerce. Just like now, why do governments want the Olympics to happen in their country? Right? Why do governments want the World Cup to come to their country? There's reasons. There, we need to be a little bit more uh, reading in here. And so the governors wanted these festivals to become the biggest, so each one wants theirs to be bigger and bigger. And of course, it's the birthday of the process, and who's ever going to say anything about that? And so slowly but surely, from 660 AH, it began to spread in, in Sunni lands. Initially, some scholars opposed it. Some scholars you know, said, well, if you do it with these conditions, it's okay. After a while, under public pressure, just the floodgates opened, and it became a very, very common uh, festival. And you all know my opinion on this is that... Uh, the way to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet if you, really, if you really wanted to celebrate it, is to fast on Mondays. Because that's what he would do. If you really want to celebrate his birthday, then you should fast every Monday. Because when he was asked, why do you fast on Monday? He said, because I was born on a Monday. So to take one day of the year and do events and whatnot, I mean, I'm not going to be harsh here, but let me just say, it's a really easy cop-out to show that you're loving the Prophet If you do something one day. Real love is to be dedicated throughout the year, right? Real love is to show that love every single day. And not just one day of the year by giving some money and going to a festival. Nonetheless, so because the first time that the Mawlid was celebrated was the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, what happened? It became the date associated in the minds of the people. Even though, and then we conclude here with this section, move on to the next one. Even though academically speaking, it is actually a very weak date. And the 8th and the 10th and even the 2nd, are more authentic historically, and they have evidences from the Sahaba and Tabi'un more than the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Now, 
We also know that, and there are chains of narrators back to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib who died 95 Hijrah, so there's a gap, he didn't see the Prophet But he said that it has been narrated to me that the Prophet was born at high noon. So there's a gap, but it is a gap in early Islam, so we can overlook it. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib died 95, his father is of the age of the companions, right? So we, we can overlook this little gap, and this is the only narration that we have about the timing of his birth. And that is high noon, when the sun was at its pinnacle and peak. And of course, there is a clear symbolism here that is not lost on anybody, that when the sun is brightest, this is when the Prophet ﷺ is coming out with his own truth. That is when Allah is revealing, or, or Allah is sending down the Prophet ﷺ because it is coinciding with the time of the bright sun. Just like the bright sun illuminates everything, so too this Prophet ﷺ will illuminate everything and nothing will remain uh, dark around him. Now, when it comes to the actual birth of the Prophet Sallallahu there are so many legends and so many narrations, not one of which is academically sound, except for one, except for one. All the rest of them are really legends. And these legends are mentioned, and SubhanAllah, what is really amazing, and you know, I have to say this frankly here, that we don't need to invent lies to praise the Prophet ﷺ. We don't need to invent fairy tales. Allah has praised him enough, and the facts are enough. We don't need to, to, to fabricate things. And what is really amazing is that the earliest books you go to has the least information. But as you go on and on in history, then the books get bigger and bigger, and the details get more and more. And you wonder, where did this come from? And I mean, if you want to come to my house to even demonstrate to you, Ibn Ishaq is this big. And then I have another book written in the 9th century about the seerah. Wallahi, it is this big. Now Ibn Ishaq is the first book of seerah, right? And he is saying, I want to write everything I come across. And it's this big. And then you have a book written 700 years later, five times the size of Ibn Ishaq. And this book is full of, and it is said to me, and my shaykh said, and this and that. Where is it coming from? Where, it's something that, as we said, little bit legends and whatnot. So, what some of you might have heard, the Prophet ﷺ was born, let's say, already circumcised. One, one report says. Another, another says he was born and he fell into sajda. Another said he was born and he lifted his finger to the sky to say the shahada. I mean, well, like, just we don't need to do this and it makes a mockery of our religion. It makes a mockery of our religion. We don't need to invent these things about the Prophet ﷺ. He is the best human being. And the facts are enough to show us that. And when we resort to these tales, Wallahi, it, it makes our religion not look as dignified as it needs to look, you know. Ibn Ishaq mentions none of these things, none of these things. Because he doesn't have this information. But when you turn to books written in 700 Hijra, 800 Hijra, MashaAllah, the guy knows so many details, you wonder, where did he get it from, okay? There's only one hadith that mentions the birth of the Prophet. He mentions his own birth. And it is a hadith narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad's book of hadith, and it is an authentic hadith. That the Prophet ﷺ said, when my mother gave birth to me. Aha, so now he's telling us. It's a hadith that goes back to him. It's not some... Per because again, imagine who witnessed Amina in the room. Come on. You know, use the brain that Allah has given us. Would a man be there and witness Amina being given birth? So that he then narrates that when he came out, he fell into a sajda. When he came out, he lifted his finger to the sky. I mean, you think about it. But now the Prophet is saying, so Allah told him this happened. He is saying, when my mother gave birth to me, this happened. Right? So now this is something we don't have to doubt at all. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us. So he said that when my mother was carrying me, this is the first thing, that when my mother was carrying me, uh, and in one version, وَضَعَتْنِي gave birth to me. So there are both versions are mentioned. But the point is when he was either in the room or when he came out, my mother saw a light emanate from her that cast its light or, or it reached all the way to the city of Busra in the land of Syria. The city of Busra in the land of Syria. Busra is on the on the south, south which is the border of this of what is is what? Near Dara. Near Dara. But these people don't know where Dara is, so that doesn't do us much good. Okay. I might but these people don't know where Dara is. It's basically very close to the Arabian border. It's on more on the southern side of the Arabian, of what is now Saudi Arabia, let's say closer to that side. So it's on the southern side of Syria. So the Prophet is saying that my mother saw a light, either in a dream or a physical light, she doesn't mention what, coming from her that came all the way and illuminated the, the palaces or the city of Busra, 
the palaces of the cities of Busra in Sham, in Syria. Now, what is the significance of this? Scholars have tried to understand why Syria and why you know, this light coming from Amr. Of course, the light is him. The light is the Prophet ﷺ, that she's carrying something that will bring light to Busra of Sham. Allah knows best, but there are some things that have been derived here that Sham or Syria is mentioned because... Now the people of Syria can be happy. Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of Syrians here. Last time I taught this class, there was no Syrians there. So now we have a lot of Syrians here. Syria is a blessed land, according to our religion. Now before you get really happy, do realize that the Islamic Syria is not modern Syria. Islamic Syria includes modern day Jordan and modern day Palestine, a number of different. So Sham is broader than modern day Syria, but you guys are included so you can breathe easily. Alhamdulillah. So you are the core, yes, you are the core, true. So it is true that our religion considers Sham to be a holy land overall. And of course, uh, the, the children of Ishaq, uh, Bani Israel, the Jews, they always considered that region to be holy, and in particular, Palestine region to be holy. To this day, they do that, right? So, we also believe that there is a type of holiness in these lands. And that, and that is why Allah says in the Quran, Subhana li asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa al barakna hawlahu. There is barakah around masjid al aqsa. This is Sham. Sham, there is barakah over there. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that Sham will remain a fortress of Islam. There's always going to be people of Islam in uh, Sham. And amazingly, Sham was the first major country that was conquered, a uh, province that was conquered after the Arabian Peninsula, right? Right after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sham was conquered. And one of the first cities, maybe even the first city that was outside the Arabian Peninsula is Busra. So there is an indication that the Prophet ﷺ is going to challenge status quo. Sham was the right arm of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, Damascus, do you understand? We think of Damascus as an Arab land or an Arab civilization. Before the coming of Islam, Damascus was the right hand of the Byzantine Empire. It was the jewel of, of the Romans. It was where everything happened, commerce and trade and culture and civilization, everything was there. It was impossible for the Arabs to think that one day Damascus would be the core of Arab civilizations. The Umayyads capital was Damascus. So by showing the light going to the borders of Syria, there is an indication that Islam is going to conquer this land. It will take over. And that's exactly what happened. That the very first land that was conquered was the land of uh, Syria. And we also believe as Muslims that Isa ibn Maryam will come down in Sham. He's not going to come down in Mecca and Medina. He will descend in Sham because it was Sham that was made holy by his ancestors, the children of Ishaq. It was Sham that was made holy. And he will come down in uh, Damishq and that is where he will meet the Mahdi and that is of course uh, towards the end of time. So Sham has a, sim uh, a symbolism and of course over at this point in time I have to make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal frees Sham from the tyranny that it is currently undergoing and that Allah helps uh, the people who are trying to oppose this, this tyranny and gives them sabr and patience and may Allah Azza wa Jal bring the glory of Sham that used to be bring it back to uh, Sham. Uh, we finish up here, there's only a few minutes left. We finish up here by mentioning a few more things that are uh, alleged to have occurred um, that are not found in the authentic books, but they're Allahu Adam. But it says that the uh, temples of the pagans fell down in other lands. I mean, these are things that there's no recorded history of, and I don't believe this to be true myself. Now, one thing a lot of scholars say that when the Prophet was born, this was when the jinn were stopped entry from the heavens. You guys are familiar with this concept? That the jinn were allowed entry into the heavens to listen to the angels. And Allah references in the Quran, in Surah Al-Jinn, that, وَأَنَّا كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدَ لِلسَّمْعَ We used to listen, we had our resting places, and we would listen to the uh, angelic discussions. فَمَنْ يَسْتَمِعِ الْآنَ يَجِدْ لَهُ شِحَابَ الرَّسَلِ Whoever listens now will find Shihab and Rasada, or basically uh, comets or whatnot, uh, kicking him out. So w one group of scholars says, when the Prophet was born, this was when the heavens were closed to these shayateen. But the correct opinion is that this occurred not at the birth, but when he became a prophet, i.e. at the age of 40. 
And this is clearly referenced in other hadith as well. That when Iqra came down, when Jibreel came down, basically revelation, that was when the skies were closed. And that was when the jinns began wondering what is happening. And then Allah says in the Quran that a group of jinn heard the Quran being recited. And they came back believing in the Quran. So this did not occur at the birth. I just wanted to point that out. And the final thing that we'll say, time is already up. SubhanAllah, I was wanting to go a few more pages, but uh, time is already up. Uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that the Prophet was circumcised on the seventh day. Pause here for a while. Later books, seven centuries later, mention he was born uncircumcised. The first book mentions, factually, matter of fact, that Ibn that his grandfather circumcised him on the seventh day. And this is, subhanAllah, there's nothing wrong with this. He is a normal child, born of a normal uh, 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 marriage, a normal birth. And so his grandfather circumcised him on the seventh day. And his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, held a feast for him. And his grandfather chose the name Muhammad, which was a unique and unusual name. Some scholars say that this was an unknown name to the Arabs. And one group of scholars says, well, it was known, but it was not common. And this seems to be the stronger opinion. Because there are people whose references we have, whose name was Muhammad. But it was a very uncommon name. And there was nobody in Mecca by that name. Nobody in Mecca. So when people asked Abdul Muttalib, why are you calling him by a name that nobody knows? Nobody's heard of. Why don't you call him one of your standard names of your fathers and, and forefathers? He said, I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people of the heavens. Muhammad means the one who is praised. I want him to be praised by the people of the earth as I want him to be praised by the people in the heavens. And when the Prophet ﷺ was born, uh, the news spread amongst uh, the Quraysh and Abu Lahab, who was later to become an enemy, at this time of course he is an uncle, and of course he's always going to remain an uncle, but at this time he is not an enemy. Abu Lahab, who was one of the older uncles by the way, because remember, there were ten brothers, and Abu Lahab was born of an, another mother, no other full brother. Abu Lahab did not have any full brother. Abu Talib and Abdullah were full brothers, and others were full brothers. Hamza and others were full brothers. Hamza and Safiya were full brother and sister. Abu Lahab was his own. He didn't have any full. He was much older. So perhaps he felt a type of, I have to care for this offspring, this orphan. You know, my younger brother died and whatnot. Perhaps he felt some sympathy. And so the, the girl that came running, the slave girl that came running to tell him that your uh, son's brother has been born, your, or your son's offspring has been born. This girl, as soon as Abu Lahab heard the news, he told her, I set you free. I'm so happy, you're free. It was a slave girl. So he became so happy that just because she came with this good news, he set her free. It shows you he was so happy. And her name was Thuwayba. Thuwayba. And in our Indian Pakistani culture, it was transformed to Sobia. But it is in fact Thuwayba. Uh, and so, and those of you who are named Sobia, this goes back to this misreading of Thuwayba. Uh, nothing wrong with it, by the way, but it's just the, the name. Uh, and so, uh, there is a hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad, and with this hadith we conclude and then pray, inshallah, that Hamza saw, or sorry, not Hamza, Abbas, Abbas saw Abu Lahab in a dream. After he died, Abu Lahab, after Abu Lahab died, he saw him in a dream. And he saw him being punished with the utmost severe punishment. Because this is Abu Lahab, Tabbati da Abi Lahab and Watab. So, Abbas said to him, Did not your relationship with the Prophet, your uncle, who basically, you're the, you know, benefit you? He said, No, except for one thing that I did. That when the good news came that he was born, I freed Thuwayba, and because of this, I am allowed a few drops of water. A few drops of water. Because I did this good thing when the Prophet was born, because of this, I'm allowed just a little bit of, of that's my concession that's given to me. That's all that is uh, given to him. But the point being that he 
released Thuwayba and gave, made her free, so she was happy at the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will continue inshallah next week and the week after that and then for the month of July uh, the, uh, a different series will start. Dr. Bashar will take over completely in a different series. Uh, two weeks we'll be doing the seerah inshallah ta'ala uh, and with this we don't have time for questions so we will uh, call somebody to do the adhan and I will see you inshallah uh, next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.